this is the Roaring Elephant Podcast. And here I am with my cloudy with a chance of meatballs co-host, Yon. No, 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 no. I'm firm with my feet on the ground. That's that's the, that's the new, new, new hotness. Stay on the ground. No, okay. no more clouds. Clouds are bad. <laughs> But but we need clouds. We need we need the clouds. We need the the rain they provide and the shade and the the fluffy um, the fluffy pictures in the sky. You just have to invent that rain that doesn't need clouds. Simple. Oh, that sounds like a lot of hard work. Well, if somebody else needs it, has to do it, it's not work for me. <laughs> so I'm happy with it. <laughs> I've had to, had to think uh, about that one. How do I get myself out of that? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, that rather rambling and random intro uh, may or may not uh, inform you that we are talking about the cloud uh, this week. It's not unusual for us to talk about the cloud, uh, but in this particular episode, we're talking about uh, why why leave the cloud, and that doesn't mean you're uh, uh, putting down your harp and uh, and uh, descending back down. Uh, this is about leaving the cloud, as in cloud computing, and going back to, well, going back to another option. And this was inspired by, those of you on YouTube can see, there's an article from the folks at um, Basecamp, uh, also responsible for Hay and uh, a bunch of other additional services. And they sort of talked about the fact that they're they're leaving um, the, the the cloud world behind. They've been um, pretty extensively uh, uh, an AWS and GCP customer for several years, and uh, you know, it's just not where they want to be anymore. So we thought this was uh, it's an interesting conversation mm -hmm. that uh, comes up from time to time, both as some organizations are you know, still actually on the journey moving towards cloud um, and uh, just at the same time that apparently other organizations are moving away from cloud. So it, it, we've talked about this sort of thing before um, a number of times, but what's not sort of really clear from at least from the, the article and the information they talk about so far is just how far out of cloud they're actually uh, they're actually pulling, and yeah, are they going to go and build their own data centers? Are they just going colo? Are they going multi-region? Are they still thinking about you know, scaling and stuff like that? Um, but if we sort of put the base camp thirty-seven signals hey um, situation aside. Yeah, what are your views, Jan? Like, should we should we all be uh, heading back to the wonderful world of bare metal and and doing everything yourself and uh, having the full control? I've got, I've got the ideal situation. I've got my servers in the next room here. That's ideal. It's good for heating. It's <laughs> not so good for the power grid here, but. Uh... Now, we haven't talked uh, about this too much before recording, so we don't really know where each of us stand. But I do think we have, kind of have the same response, I dare say, which is it depends. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, cloud has always been a tool in a toolbox. And I do think people have done it wrong in the in the past, yeah. recent past, by going lock, stock and barrel to cloud, even if there wasn't a good reason for it. I mean, one of the most voiced reasons to go to the cloud that I've heard is the worst I can think of and is moving uh, CapEx to OPEX, moving mm. money that is sunk in hardware or real estate, if you want to take it more broadly, into something that is not sunk but can be dismissed at any moment then, then you, without any notice. And of course, doing that means that somebody else has to do this sunk cost and they will have to protect themselves. If everybody suddenly stops using the stuff, they will still need to pay off that hardware. I mean, the, the hyperscalers still buy that hardware. They don't rent it. They sometimes even build it, mm. but still they have money invested in that, that stuff. So they need to protect themselves from people leaving that piece of hardware behind. And that means they will rent it out at a higher price. OPEX will always be, all, almost always be more expensive than CAPEX. It's just on the bookkeeping level. It's in a different column. 
and certain ways of looking at things, especially going to stock exchange and uh, IPOs and things like that, that makes it look more nice. But it's definitely the worst reason to go to cloud. There's, there's good reasons to go to cloud, a lot of them even. This ain't one. Yeah. I mean, the, the other one that we uh, regularly hear and also regularly debunk is cost. Like cloud being cheaper <laughs> is the is the sort of thing often that cloud vendors uh, will be pitching, but that uh, that very very few people actually um, realize. And the 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 base camp folks actually talk about a few kind of clear reasons or a few clear things that in their mind are the reasons that you should. Yeah. should stay in cloud or should move to cloud uh, don't go to the positives yet because the, the cost the cloud costing is, is a good one to go, to, to go a little bit deeper upon i think mm. because you said the cloud vendors hyperscalers typically say cloud is cheaper well no they never say cloud is cheaper they say they your total cost of ownership when you use cloud is cheaper and then they bring in a lot of secondary costs that you supposedly can save upon like people personnel downtime things like that and in my experience, when people go to cloud for the good reasons, and we'll see the good reasons in a second, it typically makes everything more complicated. Because if you don't have direct access to your computers, to your servers, then you will have to set up systems to have remote access. That makes them more complicated. Also, some of the advances of the cloud will note, we'll mention them in a, in a minute, kind of engender more complicated architecture, more loosely coupled architectures and things like that, which makes things harder to maintain. Now, while it's true that you will be able to maybe fire some people that do nothing but disk swapping all the day, and one might argue that that is not a job a human should do, <laughs> but you probably still will be paying the same amount of people. Now, in the ideal situation, whatever you're building is going to have more revenue. You will get more money in for the same or similar amount of cost, or even if it's a bit more cost. So in that case, you, could, you can't say cloud is cheaper, but it is a good investment if you fall under the categories of what you're going to mention in a second here, the good reason to go to cloud. Because again, for some companies, that just isn't a good point. Mm. In my opinion, of course. Yeah. I mean, the, the flip side to the, the, the conversation around the, the sunk investment and the other, the other sort of side of things is, is like wildly um wildly swinging um sort of utilization like if you've got workloads that are very spiky very maybe they're seasonal maybe they're um very um you know, very significantly by day to day or hour to hour or even minute to minute based on you know whatever is happening within your business or within your services uh, that you provide you know, those are the 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 cases I would I would say that cloud providers often do talk mm -hmm. about being um, the the perfect use cases for um, cloud because you know you don't you only pay for the uh, the services you consume you don't pay for um, everything that just sits there waiting for those peaks to happen. Now the challenge with that, of course, is that there's a huge amount of time and effort and work that needs to go into uh, building something that can scale up and down effectively um, in in that way. Now you can do that you know, any any variety of different ways. You can do that with various different types of auto scaling. You can do it with various different types of consumption of um, past services or um, you know, other layers of technology that don't require you to go and manually deploy extra things. But there's there's always going to be time and effort that you need to pour into that in order to make that work effectively. And there's also going to be a bunch of testing and a bunch of edge cases that you will you will hit along the way. Uh, I would actually posit that spikiness is not a good cloud use case. Hmm. I'll separate it out into spiky loads and growth. Now growth, you know you're starting small, but you'll need like an extra server every month or so. 
getting hardware in these days is very hard to do, very unpredictable, and a cloud can help you in that scaling growth. And also if you just start something new and you have no idea how much demand there will be, you're not gonna buy a hundred servers hoping you'll need them. You kind of want that soft start and that's where a cloud is a good use case for, I think, because it's not perfect, but at least it will give you a growth pattern. Spiky loads, however, have a problem. All of the clouds love scaling up. The auto scaling mm -hmm. for scaling up, yeah, that works beautifully. But the moment that anything you're doing is has some gravity, maybe data or something else, scaling down is a lot harder. Also, the peaks, either they're huge, and then you're more in a growth scenario, but the growth scenario on very short term, 30 minutes up, 30 minutes down, mm. there's quite often not enough resources available because these hyperscalers, they are not infinite either. They have a number of VMs of certain size available, and you will get an allocation of that. You will never get every single last one because they have more than one customer. They're again over committing their environment in the hopes that nobody will use everything at the same time. That's mm -hmm. like the gym membership. They want to sell all the gym memberships. They hope you don't show up because the room is too small for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I have actually had customers in my previous jobs where they had a problem. They wanted to scale up and Cloud said no. Yes. So how do you solve that? Well, let's keep some hardware warm on standby, allocated and ready to go. Yeah, that's what you do with servers. Mm -hmm. So you kind of lose that flexibility there. So again, for the spiky workloads, if it's a very slowly ramping up growth, then yep, cloud can really work until the point you reach break even. And that's basically what the guys from Basecamp and Hey are saying. Mm -hmm. we, we've reached that point that it's no longer chaotic. We kind of have a good capacity planning happening now. So we don't need that scale. We have predictability. But the moment you have the capacity planning, yeah, I can kind of understand that things like growth and spiky loads are less reasons to move to a cloud environment because you're still going to be paying a lot for the resources. Your servers will always be cheaper. You'll still have the people there. And the benefit from the spiky load capturing, balancing, whatever, becomes less of a, uh, an advantage. So it's a reason to, to kind of step back again and look at your data infrastructure and see, is cloud still good for me? Mm. Some of this, I think, comes down to, so I, I've also had and worked with people and organizations where they've struggled with uh, their cloud provider of choice uh, actually having enough capacity to deal with the bursts that they've had. And the, the thing that I have seen is that has also been a driver for uh, people who go down actually rather than okay, backing off and going into a we'll, we'll have our own bare metal. I've, I've seen that as being a driver for people going to multiple cloud providers and coming up with a, a multi-cloud story as well. I know you're not a, a huge fan the of, the, right? of, of the complexity. I mean, I'm a fan but, of the idea, but the complexity mm, involved. Well, th this is another one of those things where we, we I mentioned earlier sort of people um, consuming things as, uh, you know, moving towards consuming PaaS services or even, you know, pure SaaS services to um, to sort of simplify things. Uh, and so they, they don't need to go and spin up and run individual infrastructure or whatever. But the further you go down the the SaaS and, and pass route um, and serverless and all those other things, the more you tie yourself into individual cloud providers, the, the sort of the more you have have to think about that very carefully if you're heading in a, if you want to start heading in a different direction. Yeah, I, I kind of love SaaS because we used to have this term called snow days. Now we have SaaS days. SaaS is down, everybody go home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Slack's down or Salesforce is down or exactly. whatever. But I mean, actually, that's yeah. one reason to go to cloud is a good idea. But actually, you're not going to cloud. Because if you're consuming SaaS services, it's like using utilities like electricity and water. It just mm. comes out of a delivery thingy and it becomes available. And that's not you going to cloud. That's you just deciding instead of doing our bookkeeping on Excel, I'm going to use this piece of software that I can use. And hey, this software is powered by the cloud. But I don't care. I just have a, a front end. I can put my numbers in and it works. And 
is that going to cloud? Not really, because that's typically not your core business, unless if you're a bookkeeping company, I guess. <laughs> but typical companies, they use SaaS services as a support mechanism. I mean, a lot of sales organizations use Salesforce. Well, Salesforce is not something they sell, unless if you're Salesforce, <laughs> it's something you use. And that's not going to cloud. When you say going to cloud, it's putting your money maker from your own servers to a cloud environment. The first part, using the support things, putting that stuff in the cloud, yeah, makes sense. If you can do SaaS stuff, it makes total sense. You can probably have a better way of paying per seat and things like that, which can make sense if you have a certain size, if it's just mom and pop shop, no need to do that. You're probably gonna be very happy with Excel sheet and even Excel is in the cloud these days with Office 365 or the Google Sheet alternative, of course. Uh, but you have your choices there. But the moment you have an enterprise, then yeah, putting that kind of stuff as a SaaS service kind of makes sense. Just like you don't have your own wells in your garden to take your own water. Makes sense. Or indeed, uh, uh, run your own power plant as the uh, Well, I was going to say the, that and I didn't because use within. <laughs> we're doing solar panels now. So we are starting to do our own, so our own <laughs> energy power that's plants. A, that's a very good point. Actually, you could and say that this is the same thing. Mm. I mean, the, the other thing that um, it de I think depends on how far you're quote unquote pulling out of cloud is, is you know, just how far you're, you're going down that journey. Like, are you, are you going to go and build all of your own data centers, set up all of your own network links and power links and, you know, start owning real estate that you then put servers and cooling and like everything else. Are you, are you thinking of going all the way back to, to owning everything? Again, there are definite advantages to that. You have total control. Um, and uh, it's, it's, let's face it, that's where this pretty much all started. Or are you, you know, going to a middle ground where you're maybe um, taking up some form of colo or co-location service where someone else provides the building, the underlying infrastructure, the networking, the power, um, cooling, and all those other things. And, you know, you just provide the the hardware that mm -hmm. uh, that you're going to... Um, uh, the racks. Hardware and the networking and all that sort of thing. And Or are you going down the route of... Uh, no, someone else even provides the hardware. It's just that it is physical hardware, and we just then manage you know what goes on top of it. So there's also a varying degrees of of just how far people want to go with this. Yeah, and it's all about how much control you want to wrestle back from other entities. And I've seen mm. a bit of a backlash now. We have seen this before with the, the big ISVs doing these multi-year, multi-decennia projects never resulting in anything. Outsourcing kind of came a bit to an end. People were doing things in-house again to have differentiation, to have more control. And I think this is also what you're seeing on the cloud now. They first have done this gold rush towards offsourcing all of the, outsourcing all of the hardware to the cloud providers. And now people are pulling back again because of the same reasons. They've lost control. They've lost predictability. It's also chaotic. And yeah, if you want to budget something, budgeting for cloud is hard. Mm. Now, the middle grounds that you mentioned were all middle grounds that don't in cloud clue, uh, include cloud. Interesting. Mm. Uh, and there's one I'm missing here. And I'm actually kind of mad to the hyperscalers because they should have done this and they quite intentionally don't. And that's hybrid, cloud mm. bursting. Because a lot of these things can be solved with effective cloud bursting, having stuff on premise for your day to day normal load. And if you have those spikes, if you have that growth or something you need to capture, burst to the cloud. Now, technically, it's complicated, but not more complicated than multi cloud because mm. you're still joining two infrastructures together, basically. Yeah. It would allow you to get more more uh, control over the, the parts you want to have control up and your bit of variability becomes less chaotic because it's a smaller part of the whole. Now, the problem is that all three big cloud providers in, uh, in the Western world, they all have a hybrid cloud story and they all don't sell it because they don't want to sell you. I think Amazon was the first one that started with, the, with that story. The other two had to jump on board because if cloud A has something, cloud B and C need to have mm. it too, or else they by definition worse, right? Because they don't have something that I don't have. 
but they all have something out there that's called hybrid cloud and none of them actually push it. Actually, I'm pretty sure they have internal restrictions of not pushing it because they want stuff in the cloud. They want you in their cloud. They want that stickiness. They don't want you to have that control because that's when they have, they have control and everyone wants to have the control. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not bad. It's just business. That's how they think. Mm. It's their business model is to sell cloud. Why would they help you use less cloud? It doesn't make sense for them to do that. But that's something we kind of missed. And I don't see how we could unmiss that because as long as the cloud providers are responsible for their own bottom line, and they are, they're going to make sure their bottom line works. And as long as the there is no in-between organization, whatever that comes up to do that, it's not going to happen. I mean, things like Cloud Native Foundation could have done something like that, but hey, it's in the name, right? Cloud Native. They're also not going to be looking at hybrid because I guess it wasn't sexy. At the time, everything had to go cloud and serverless and things like that. And you also see this might be a good point to continue on if you don't have anything to add to this uh, part of the conversation. Yeah, go for it. Serverless is the next thing that's happening here, which is again, try the cloud's mm -hmm. getting more control over what you're trying to do because now it's totally opaque how, how your pricing is being calculated because, hey, it's serverless. We sell, we said you use this and you can't believe this. I'm not saying hyperscalers are being bad here. There's no fraudulent activity. They probably have good reasons of calculating that and we'll give you some clarity if you ask for that. But again, you are losing another part of control from the software and deployments and everything into that serverless. And while serverless is a good idea technically, just like containerization is a good idea, just like virtualization is a good idea, just like CICD is a good idea, it's a good idea for certain use cases. Mm. And uh, this is something, I mean, the reason I'm talking about serverless now is because in my day-to-day -day job, I, it, this comes up more and more because the hyperscalers yeah. are pushing this serverless more and more because, again, it gives them more control. It's something for their bottom line makes total sense. It will push this. But it's totally un, unclear what the end effect will be of going serverless with everything. My first inklings are that it gets more expensive because yes, you can do more scaling, more auto scaling. It's going to be more flexible, everything, but everything we talked about before still applies. You still mm. have that. Let's keep stuff warm because cloud might not have the services available and I need it and things like that. Yeah, I, I think this, in my mind, at least this all comes down to the, the first two words that you uttered pretty much at the beginning of this. Could have, which is, could have saved us all a lot of time then, basically. <laughs> no, I mean, which is it depends. I, I, I think that yeah. there's, there is never one right answer for everybody. And I think the, the thing that I, I think about most of this is that too often people just get wrapped up in, well, everyone's doing X, so I should be doing X. And some very successful companies are doing X, so let's do X. Yeah. Google's been a yeah. big push for this, right? Yeah, yeah. And so for me, it's all about I, not ignore what you know companies are doing X, but yes, for sure, consider it, but learn evaluate it. it, learn from it, but evaluate it within the context of what you're doing yeah. and what you need as an organization. Because just, just because company Y is doing X, that doesn't necessarily mean that it will be the right fit for you. And that's exactly the same as, you know, um, the, the folks at, uh, at um, Hay and, and Basecamp, like just because they're moving away from cloud, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the right thing for you to do based on your utilization, your infrastructure, your particular usage pattern, or whatever it might be. Um, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's nothing to do with technology. Maybe it's all to do with staffing, for example. Like there's, there's, there's a variety of things that could guide your your reasoning in one direction or another or somewhere in between. Yeah, I mean, the final thing I would add here is that when you come to the choice of going to or moving away from cloud, make sure that the people that have expertise make the decisions. Because when I started here talking about capex and opex. I mean, your CFO deciding to go to cloud. Mm, yeah. That's again, the wrong reasoning. Now, if the CFO has talked to the, the CISO and talked to the CTO and they got, to, got together and they've hammered it out and yep, makes sense, then you can have a good path forward. But make sure that the people that are making the decision actually know what it all entails. Because I still see an awful lot of 
mm. sea level people make decisions to go to cloud and all the people below them are saying oh my god what am i going to do with this and uh on the on the flip side though i also see a whole bunch of let's just say very smart people making a decision to go in one direction and it, it it goes up to an exec and the exec goes, what on earth are you doing? Like, why on earth would we do that? I understand that you like it for your reasons, but you need to look at the bigger picture. And that there's there's always going to be a, a degree of, of push and pull and a degree of tension around that. But yeah, it, it's work. it's got to be teamwork. It's got to be collaboration. It's not just you know one side of the the equation that's got to make these decisions. It's got to work for the whole exactly. company. Yeah. All right. Anything more you want to add? Nope. I think that's everything for me. Then that is all the time we have for today. You can support this podcast. Please become a patron. Contributions do help us keep this around for seven years and more. We're on YouTube. You can like, subscribe, hit the notification bells, do YouTube stuff, make Dave happy. Go to www.roaringout.org. There's links to the Patreon page, to the YouTube page, and a lot of more information about the podcast. And you can follow us on Twitter using the ad Roaring Elephant tag. You can send your feedback by email to podcast at roaringalpha.org and we read every email and enjoy every suggestion you make. Until next time, my name is the Fallen Angel, Jon. And my name is the cloud is just someone else's computer, Dave. And we look forward to debunking that next week. Goodbye. <laughs> See you then. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>